Hi everyone, welcome to Sensor 101. What is continuous glucose monitoring or CGM therapy? My name is Emily. I'm one of the diabetes educators at Children's Minnesota, and I'll be walking you through this content. I will get my screen shared with you and we will dive on in to some education. All right, so if you are here, you are somebody who is checking blood sugars and sensor therapy is a really fantastic way to continue checking blood sugars, but making it a little bit easier on your life. So let's find out a little bit more. Okay, so I have our general children's disclaimers and confidentiality protections. You can return to this slide if you like in the future, otherwise I will keep moving on. So let's begin with what is a continuous glucose monitor or CGM? Now, quick thing here is CGM is interchangeable with the term sensor. You'll hear me use both terms, but just know that they are the same concept. So a CGM is a small medical device that is worn on the body, and it is continuously measuring glucose levels in the interstitial fluid. It is measuring a new glucose level every single minute. There are three different brands that are currently on the market. There is the Medtronic sensor that looks like this, the Libre sensor that looks like this, and the Dexcom sensor that looks like this. I'm gonna zoom in really quick for you just to give you a better glimpse. So that Medtronic sensor is on the arm there. Libre is also on the arm, and then Dexcom is on the abdomen here. Now, with that continuous measurement of the glucose level, it is then being displayed on a receiving device every one to five minutes. And this is brand dependent how quickly or how frequently those glucose levels are displayed, but they will be continuously displayed along with a trend arrow. This is an example of what that may look like. This is somebody using a mobile device as their receiving device. And so on here, you can see that there is a glucose value there's an arrow next to it. That's called the trend arrow. And then you can see a tracing at the bottom that is showing the glucose values every five minutes for the past eight or so hours. And what's really neat is on these devices, you can look at the past 24 hours of data so you can really see what's been happening in the last day. Okay, what else do we need to know about CGM therapy? So it is a three-part system. Here is a crosscut of what this may look like. So this is looking at your tissue and then the sensor sitting on top of the skin. So one part of the system is the actual sensor. This is the small electrode that is sitting under the skin. It's sitting in fatty tissue, and this is what is sensing or reading the glucose value. I just circled where the glucose sensor is labeled on the image. If you follow that line over, you can see, whoops, let me get my laser pointer. You can see that this little gold angle thing, that is showing us the sensor that is sitting under the skin. The transmitter sits on top of the skin. So it's this piece here. And the transmitter is what is transmitting or sending that glucose value to your receiving device. The transmitter is simply clipped into the sensor that's kind of sitting on the skin. And then your receiver is what is actually receiving and displaying that glucose value. This may be a mobile app or a standalone reader. It is brand dependent. All of the brands do offer a mobile app at this time. So this is an example of what that mobile app may look like, where you get that sensor value, this little um, angle here, that is the trend arrow for this brand of sensor. And then you have that reading below. This is showing the last three-ish hours of sensor readings. A couple things to know. Your receiving device or mobile app does have to be within 20 feet of the sensor to receive data. So you do want to choose a device that you'll carry with you continuously so that you get that continuous data. Some CGMs can be used for dosing decisions. This is brand dependent. So after this, you will want to watch our All About Diabetes Tech series to learn about the different brands of CGM on the market to see which brands do offer that and do not. 
On all of the systems, you can customize your alerts and alarms. What that means is you can set up the system to alert you if your blood sugar is going above or below a certain value so that you can treat it without having to necessarily feel your symptoms. You do always wanna go off of physical symptoms as well, but that sensor alert and alarm can help you notice your symptoms sooner and treat a low sooner. Sensors are waterproof, so you can wear them in the water, showering, bathing. However, the signal between the sensor, transmitter, and then to your receiver, that goes through Bluetooth, and Bluetooth can't read through water. So while you're submerged in water, you won't receive sensor data. However, once you're back above water and in range with your receiving device, the sensor values will continue to populate. A really neat thing is if you're using a mobile device to receive sensor data, you can set it up to share with loved ones remotely so that they can see um, your diabetes data a little bit further away. You can also set it up to share with our clinic. So for virtual visits or if you need assistance with dosing changes, we can just pull that data from the web instead of you having to read off glucose values to us. Now, why do we like CGM therapy? What are the benefits? So a huge benefit is that by seeing that continuous value every one to five minutes, we can fill in the dots between finger pokes to really identify patterns. So this is an example of what your blood sugars may look like if you're just using a meter. So this is showing that this person checked their blood sugar four times that day, and for the most part, they were in range. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, if you fill in the data between those finger pokes, you can see that they actually were low quite a bit, and they also had some highs they were unaware of. So what's really great is we might have actually said, we might have initially said, hey, you're in range, we're not making dose changes, but then upon seeing all of this other data and all these lows, we may decide that we need to cut back on your carb coverage or perhaps on your basal insulin. So seeing that continuous data is super helpful for making dosing decisions because we get a clear picture of what's actually happening in the body. The trend arrows and alerts and alarms are really helpful to prevent hyper and hypoglycemia. So those trend arrows, you can take a look and say, oh my goodness, I'm dropping really quickly and I'm about to go on a walk. You may want to have a snack before going on that walk so that you can prevent further hypoglycemia. The alerts and alarms are also helpful because let's say you ate some Rice Krispies, your blood sugar went high, you expect that, you can set it to remind you that your blood sugar is still high three hours later so that you know to recheck and give more insulin if needed. So the alerts and alarms can be very helpful to make sure that we're staying actively engaged in our diabetes cares. This is an example of what some of those trend arrows may look like. Um, all of the brands have different trend arrows and um, what they actually look like. So this one I like to call a pigeon head. <laughs> so it looks like a pigeon from the side. And then that head is turning up and down to indicate how quickly the glucose is rising or falling. So all of the sensors have pretty similar options where it'll show a steady blood sugar, a gradual rise, gradual fall, a quick rise and fall, and a rapid rise and fall. <clears throat> With this, there is typically a reduction in hypoglycemia. Studies have shown that there's a 38% reduction in hypoglycemia for people with type 1 diabetes. So this is huge. And then within that, 40% of that reduction is overnight. And so this is incredibly helpful and such a safety piece about sensors is just helping prevent that hypoglycemia. Some sensors do integrate with insulin pumps, and what that means is the pump is looking at the sensor data and the trend arrows, and it's making insulin dosing decisions based on that. And then the pump itself in the background is changing your insulin delivery after looking at that sensor data. So when you're using an integrated system, that can really also help improve your time and range and prevent hypoglycemia. There's the potential to lower your hemoglobin A1C level. And again, it's because you're actually seeing what's happening between finger sticks. So you can get a better sense of where blood sugars are and make targeted dose changes based on that data. Also has the potential to lower your A1C value because you're getting alerted when you're running high or sustaining high. And so you can intervene sooner rather than just 
waiting until the next finger stick to give more insulin. Sensors can also reduce your stress levels. This is because you actually know what's going on and it can give you more awareness as to what is happening in your body while you're going into an activity or starting a class. You can see what's happening right now versus having to stop, pull out your meter, check your finger stick. And then this is brand dependent, but there can be less finger sticks. So some sensors, you can make insulin dosing decisions based off of that sensor value. Some you still have to do a finger stick to confirm, but overall you typically are doing less finger sticks because you're seeing that data in between. Now let's talk about your blood glucose value versus your sensor glucose. So here's that same cross cut showing the sensor and how it sits on the skin. So let's back up just a little bit and talk about the glucose journey through the body. So when we are eating carbohydrates, our stomach is breaking those carbohydrates down into glucose molecules. Those glucose molecules then enter into the bloodstream and you can see the blood vessel at the bottom here. And the yellow circles are the glucose molecules that have entered into the bloodstream. This is where your blood glucose meter is measuring your blood glucose value. After this, the glucose leaves the bloodstream. It enters into the interstitial fluid. Your interstitial fluid is simply the fluid between the cells in the tissue. So you can see that these yellow circles are entering into this interstitial fluid. The blue blobs are your cells. So now you can see that glucose is just circulating between the cells. This is where your sensor is reading your sensor glucose. It's in that interstitial fluid. After this, the glucose leaves the interstitial fluid and enters into the cells. That's the final step of the process. Now, why is this important? Well, we wanna talk about sensor accuracy. So your sensor glucose and your blood glucose should correlate, which means they should be about 20% apart or within 20% of each other but you're rarely going to have them match exactly. And it's because they're reading glucose values in different parts of the body. This image is a little choo-choo train um, of the glucose journey. So on here, your sensor glucose is in yellow, and then your blood glucose is in the orange. And what this is showing is that as your glucose is changing, your sensor glucose is always going to be just a step behind what your meter value is. And again, it's because glucose gets to the blood first and then to the interstitial fluid. So your sensor glucose and your blood glucose will be the most similar when your blood sugar is stable. And that's because there's not a lot of glucose variability between that blood and interstitial fluid. As your glucose is rapidly changing, so let's say you just ate some carbohydrates and glucose is actively rushing into the bloodstream, that's when you're going to see the biggest discrepancy between your sensor glucose and your blood glucose. And that's because glucose may be rising quickly, quickly, quickly in the bloodstream, but it hasn't yet reached that interstitial fluid. So your interstitial fluid or sensor value will be lower than the glucose value or the blood glucose value. Similarly, if you've now taken insulin and that insulin is actively working, it's been pulling glucose out of the bloodstream and into the interstitial fluid, into the cells, and that process is going to remove glucose from the blood first and then the interstitial fluid. So your sensor value will then be higher than your glucose value. So it's just something to keep in mind. Your sensor is still safe to dose off of if it's an FDA approved sensor to dose off of. Um, but just keep in mind that it, it is going to be different than your actual meter value and that's okay, it's expected. Something to consider is that hydration really does impact your sensor accuracy. And that's because it's that interstitial fluid that is reading the, the sensor value. So if you're more dehydrated, there's less fluid, that glucose will be more concentrated and will be falsely reading high. So you wanna remain hydrated when you're using a sensor so that you can have more accurate readings. Location also matters. So where you're wearing that sensor is gonna affect the accuracy. 
you want that sensor to be sitting in fatty tissue. That's where you're, you're going to get the best interstitial fluid around the sensor. So choosing a location on your body that has substantial fatty tissue or the most, wherever that is, is going to give you your most accurate readings. Now with that, every sensor does have FDA approved locations that you can wear it. So you do want to keep that in mind as well when choosing sensor location placement. Another thing to consider is that the first 24 hours of a new sensor session is your least accurate. That's because that sensor is just newly introduced into that interstitial fluid. It likes to sit there for a while and really soak up some fluid before it becomes super accurate. So a lot of people will choose to do a finger stick or two after starting a new sensor session just to compare the two values and see how accurate it is. This isn't required, it really is based on comfort level, but it's just something to know about as well that if you're checking a manual finger stick with your new sensor, you'll likely see a bigger discrepancy those first 24 hours. Now, there are times that you're going to be checking a blood sugar with a meter. One is during a sensor warm up period. Every sensor gets changed out a certain number of days apart. Maybe every five days, it may be every 14 days. That is um, brand dependent. And every time you put a new sensor in, it has a warm up period. During this, you receive no sensor data, and so you do have to do manual finger sticks with a blood sugar meter in that time. This is what that may look like. So you can see this person was receiving sensor data, but then they had to put a new one in, so there's no recent data. And up here, you can see that they have a warm-up period remaining. They still have an hour and 41 minutes left in their warm-up period. Another time to do a manual finger stick with a meter would be if your symptoms are not matching your sensor value. Your sensor is a piece of technology, it can malfunction, so if you ever have symptoms of a low blood sugar or you're having symptoms of high blood sugars and your sensor is not reflecting how you're feeling, just do a, a finger stick with a meter to see where that blood glucose actually is. Another thing to consider is a compression low. So for sensors, you sometimes will get a false low reading called a compression low. And what that is, is if your sensor is in a place where it's being compressed. So let's say it's on the back of your arm and you're sitting against a couch and pressing really hard or you're laying directly on it. Think about when you put pressure on your hand and you'll see your skin blanch. That's because you're pressing all of the fluid out of the tissues right there. So if you're putting pressure directly on your sensor, all the fluid is being flushed from that, that spot. There's not going to be glucose there for it to sense and pick up. So if there's direct pressure on your sensor, you'll get this false reading called a compression low. This is something that over time you'll be able to identify pretty easily. Typically, you can just roll off that sensor and in the next 5 to 15 minutes, it will become more accurate again. But if that is happening, it is best to do a finger stick to confirm, am I actually low or not? Another time to use a meter is if we have repeat or sustained hypoglycemia. So this would be if your blood sugar is low, go ahead and treat that low if your sensor is saying you're low. However, in 15 minutes, if your sensor still says you're low, just do a finger stick to confirm because again, when that glucose is rapidly changing, your sensor is going to be a little bit behind that blood glucose level. And so you don't want to treat a low a second time when your blood sugar might actually have already recovered. So if you're low, go ahead and treat that low. But if your sensor still says you're low 15 minutes later, just use a meter to check. Another time to use a meter would be if your sensor has failed or has lost signal. This just happens intermittently, it's technology. So with that, it's always important that you do continue to carry your blood glucose meter with you at all times. Always good to have a backup plan. This last slide is fun. So with a sensor, you are wearing a device on your body and it's adhered with an adhesive or a tape. And so it's always a good idea to go in with a little bit of knowledge of how to manage different skin issues that might arise with a sensor. This first one is fun. So 
there are things called overlays that you can purchase, and these are adhesive patches that you can put over your sensor to help it stay on for that full sensor period, whether it be five days or 14 days. So here's a couple of examples of what those overlays may look like. You can get really fun patterned ones, you can get solid colors, or you can even get clear. You can also get a clothing or a holder called a spy belt. There's other brands too, but this is just the most popular. This can be used to hold your receiving device to make sure that it's within that 20 foot range and to receive sensor data. Sometimes when you're wearing an adhesive for a long period of time, you'll have issues with it sticking to the body or you'll have issues with rashes under that adhesive. That's when we'd recommend using either an adhesive wipe which helps adhere it to your skin, or a barrier wipe, which creates a barrier between your skin and the adhesive. This is a, a list of a couple brands that are pretty popular. They typically are dispensed in single use wipes and you just would apply it to the skin like an alcohol swab, let it dry and then insert your sensor through it. And this is just a heads up in case you have an issue, you can refer back to this and then um, purchase something to try. If you're using an adhesive wipe, you'll want to use an adhesive remover. <laughs> this is just so that you can then remove the adhesive and it doesn't stick to the skin too, too um, strongly. Dressings, um, these are all clear dressings. So sometimes people want to put a dressing on their skin and then insert the sensor through it. This is for really extreme skin irritation. So typically you don't have to do this, but it is here as an option if you need to refer back. Okay. That ends my content for now. We do have our All About Diabetes Tech video series, which details the different brands of sensors on the market. So I recommend you head over there now to learn more about what is available to you. Thanks so much, everyone. I'll see you there.